Hello, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Daisy Chitlapalli, who is the first woman president of Cisco India at SARC. So welcome, Daisy. I'm really very happy and excited to have you with the Sales Women Training community today. Thank you, Chitra. My pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Great having you here. And before we start with uh, Daisy's uh, introductions, let me tell you a little more about the community. Sales Women Training, as we know, is a community to encourage, enable, and energize women in sales to succeed and lead. Our mission is to enable one lakh women to succeed and achieve leadership roles in sales. And why are we doing this? Because there are very few women in sales, and out of every four women who join sales in entry level positions, only one remains as we move on towards leadership roles. And that is why today we have a sales leader who is a woman with us in order to share her unique journey and her learnings with the members of this community. And without further ado, let me introduce Daisy to all of you. I already mentioned that she is the first woman president of Cisco India, but that's not her only achievement. About 30 years back, when hardly any women were choosing to do engineering, she went on to do engineering and moved on uh, to the tech industry, joined Wipro, spent nine years in Wipro, and then moved on to Cisco, spent 17 years. So she is a veteran with more than two and a half decades of experience in tech sales and digital transformation and various roles in <clears throat> in Cisco, as well as with Wipro. And she's also famously said that women must choose their career first. And I'm really looking forward to asking her a little more about that quote too, and also about her journey. So let's start, if you're okay, shall we go ahead and sure. start? Of right. course, uh, let's dive straight into it. Right, so I'd like to know first about your early life and uh, why did you choose engineering? Because so many years back, and I know that really talks about how our age, but I don't want to give that away, but about uh, two and a half decades back, hardly anybody was choosing uh, to do engineering, hardly any women. So what made you choose to do engineering so many years back? So Jitra, I wish I could take credit for it, right? So I, I when I was in my... 11th, 12th standard, my intentions were not to do engineering or medicine for that matter. It was just perhaps the rebel in me because that's what most Indian children, children were expected to become. So my intentions were set on pursuing a graduation in physics and going on to do a doctorate in physics. That's what I thought I would do. But the school, because I was decently good at studies, so I went to a convent school with only girls. So there was a nun there who had seen me from the time I was a uh, I was a little child to, you know, to the high school student I was. These were the days and still is, you know, schools are still uh, rated on how many of their students go off to professional colleges. I was a good potential candidate for them to do that. So she told me, look, would you mind, you know, you can still decide, right? You can still go to go do this exam. And then, if, you know, you can still decide whether you want to go to the engineering college or not. I actually did it because it was like, okay, you know, Sure, well, I'll give it a try, why not? I had not prepared in the way that many children prepare, even in those days to go into professional colleges, but I just, I just did it out of a sense of courtesy to her and a sense of gratitude to her and that school. But by the time I went to, you know, the two, six months that it took me to figure out what it was about. So this is the late part of 12th standard, the six months it took me to figure out what it was about. I realized that it is something special if you do get into a little bit of research told me my parents were really happy-go-lucky people who just left decisions to their children on who they wanted to become. But when I looked around, I saw people were trying really hard to do this. This was not that easy. It was much easier to get into a graduate college vis a -vis get into a really good premier engineering institute. So then it became a matter of, you know, uh, get, you know, it became a challenge that was worth doing. And when I did get through, then my father said, are you sure you want to you know, you just want to say no to this and still go back to uh, doing a graduation. degree, a graduation, because this does seem to be able to set people on the right trajectory to the career and, you know, a good life later on and so on. So the lesson in there, Chitra, perhaps is sometimes, you know, and I think maybe that was the first time I said yes to an opportunity. And that's been a, when somebody else offers a counter point of view and a counter opportunity, maybe we shouldn't, you know, stay very 
we shouldn't hold ourselves back. Yeah, we shouldn't hold ourselves back and we should be adamant that the choices that we had decided for ourselves are the only choices to make, right? So it's it's always good to keep an open mind. And I say even in, even in careers, sometimes people have given me roles that I never saw or advised me to take roles that I didn't see for myself. But uh, the saying yes to opportunities is a, is a theme that continues to knock and something that I think, uh, of course, hindsight is always great, right? <laughs> when you look back, this was pro- perhaps that first instance when it's a question of somebody else putting another path in front of you and going down that path really led to really amazing things later on. But yeah, I can't take credit for my decision to go and explore engineering. I think all of that credit I must give to Sister Frida in Holy Angels in Chivandrum. Uh, and she would have, I mean, she didn't push or anything like that. She just suggested I do this. And my father just suggested, maybe you want to think about it. But uh, I'm really glad I took both their uh, suggestions. Great. So fate pushes, pushes you towards a certain path, but then it's up to you to make a success once you choose that path. Yes. That's great. So it was by default rather than by design, but I think it was a lucky uh, opportunity for you. And certainly you made the most of it. So let's move on to the uh, to the first two organizations or rather the only two organizations you've worked with. And you've had really large uh, stints of a decade nearly in Wipro and uh, 17 odd years in Cisco. So what do you think are the differences between the two organizations, especially uh, in terms of how they treat their women employees and their approach towards uh, diversity and inclusion? So Chitra, I think when I joined uh, Wipro, and again, you know, it's uh, when I joined Wipro, I thought it was very odd. I joined a group of, I still remember, 32 uh, people they had recruited as fresh salespeople, right? So some came from B school, most came from B schools and there were like three of us who had come from straight from engineering uh, college campuses. There were only three women in that batch of 32 and I thought that was odd. But then when we went into the market after the initial training, I realized that Wipro was one of the rare, rare or probably the only company that had frontline sales in that market. I started in Pune and there Wipro was the only company who had frontline uh, tech sales people who were women. I think uh, it was really amazing to see, you know, now there's a lot of conversation about diversity and inclusion, but it's really great to see how Wipro practiced that, you know, they didn't talk too much about it, but they walked the talk quite well. And they, it's the cultural setting of companies where you, diversity is appreciated, not just gender diversity, but diversity in general is appreciated. There's a culture where everybody's heard, uh, everybody's given their space to express themselves, be themselves. But at the same time, there's a very pragmatic way uh, of, you know, I remember my early days in sales and in, in Bangalore and public sector and things are not as, as seamless as they are today. So you still had to take print, lots of pages of print out and box them and make sure the bids went in. And you had team members who wouldn't, you didn't need to ask them to hang around, right? They just hung around. They helped you with all the peripheral stuff. And then they dropped you back home fairly late in the night. The company didn't tell them to do it. Uh, you know, it was just a very easy and nice way of making sure that people who were differently set up, it was a good way of practicing equity, I would say. Uh, so that's something that I saw at Wipro quite strongly. The other thing that I walked away from Wipro with is this whole notion of, uh, again, uh, this whole notion of doing business the right way. Right. It was not only, you know, it was not ethical way. Fun. The ethical way, the ethical way. It was not about just the right thing to do, but Wipro instilled in me this very, very early. This was my, it was my first job, so it instilled in me the this this real pragmatism that if you don't do business the ethical way, you cannot do business sustainably at all. It yeah. is the right thing at all. It's the right thing to do, but also it's good for business because that's the only way to build a sustainable business. And I don't need to. I mean, if you just look around in India, you have plenty of examples of people who very good brands, but who were held by the wayside simply because they didn't come through on this one. Right? That was the second right. one. The third, I think, is uh, I remember the Ilatu earthquakes, I think the early 2000s. And again, corporate social responsibility is not a very, uh, you know, it's not talked about much in the early 2000s in India. And I remember this email that we got as employees that asked us for 100 rupees to be deducted from our payroll and we could say if we didn't want it. So, you know, this early, very early conversation about the role you have 
as a working professional, but also the responsibility and awareness of society at large. And interestingly, I've said this before as well, things are common. You know, the reason I've only worked into two companies perhaps is the fact that their value systems align very closely with, with mine, because a lot of that I see is also at, true at Cisco. The only thing perhaps, uh, you know, which came home to me in Cisco was Cisco, when I joined Cisco, it was a very small multinational. And in the, in the, in the way that, in terms of the number of people that worked for it, in terms of the size of operation. But one, and it was a time when most of multinationals depended heavily on Indian companies to, for market making, uh, for market making. But the thing I learned at Cisco is to lead from the front to, to the point you made earlier about creating your destiny, not just, not just accepting your destiny, but about creating, leading from the front, leading a conversation from the front uh, in an attempt to create your own destiny for yourself. So uh, while I gave you an example of my early life where things happened to me at Cisco, I learned that you lead conversations from the front and you make, you, you have a role to play in making your destiny. I think the other piece is about, you know, compassion, leading with compassion, leading with empathy. These are things that, that are also very, very strong in the, in the value systems of Cisco. So a lot of things are common between Wipro and Cisco, but this one perhaps is, I'm not saying Wipro didn't do it, but it just came home to me much more strongly because of the uh, dynamics of the, of the Cisco that I had joined in India um, 17 years ago. Right. So two, three very interesting points you brought in. Uh, one is that, of course, including women and uh, other diverse groups without making a loud noise about it, because a lot of people pay lip service, but hardly do uh, much about it. And the second thing is about ethical selling. So that uh, always, I think sales has these negative connotations and associations of sales professionals being hustlers and always trying to be pushy and trying to sell you something you don't need or you don't want. So I think ethical selling, yes, Wipro, yes, Cisco. And I would agree that uh, they have kind of elevated sales and the role of sales professionals. So uh, Cisco, of course, has been consistently voted amongst Fortune 100's best places to work for and great places to work for, and also in terms of uh, diversity. So specifically, what is Cisco doing uh, in the areas of diversity and inclusion? So I think we have a number of programs, Chitra. I think, the, I mean, let me talk about sales because this is a conversation about, about women in sales. So in sales, we are, for the last few years, for the last many years now, we are very, very conscious of our early in career intake being representative of the general population, which means we do want a half and half conversation when uh, women come into the sales force, because we think if we can start there, then our hope is that we can then move them uh, through the ladder, you know, move them up the right. ladder. And uh, that's, that's, so we have to catch them early and we have to bring them into the company when they are getting into sales, that's that's one way. Uh, we do recognize that women have life events and women do drop out of the workforce, um, right. mainly during children. We continue to battle with it, what we call the middle leak, right? And that, right. that tends to happen between that early, early newly married to early uh, childhood of the of, of, or early motherhood uh, situation. So we do have a lot of dropouts or struggles during that time. So we do, we have a conscious bring women back to work program, not just in sales, but across the company. So we stay very close to women who have left Cisco because of reasons, because of priorities that they have to, and choices they have to make at that time. We stay very close to them in an attempt to bring them back at the earliest opportunity, provided that's what they want for themselves. We also stay close to, and this is a program that's open, of course, to any woman in India or in the world who's had to leave the workplace for a priority that was not their career at that point in time. Um, in terms of the leaders, leadership itself, and this is not just true for just women, but this is true more broadly. There is, as for leadership, we are we are all encouraged to participate in a in a in a program that's called the multiplier uh, effect, and the multiplier effect is not just the, the philosophy of multiplier effect is uh, Brian Stevenson, the black rights uh, lawyer. Um, he talks about the necessity to be proximate to a person to really understand what they are going through. And this can be a woman, this can be somebody, any other disenfranchised person. 
So the the request of us as leaders is that we get proximate to somebody who is diverse from us. It can be a woman, it can be somebody who is, you know, differently sexually oriented, any, yeah, they're just somebody different from us so that you really can walk through their experiences. You have the ability to walk a mile in their shoes and understand their issues and therefore become an ally and a spokesperson and a sponsor for them. So that's what the multiplier effect is about. And one of the biggest constituencies that is benefited from the multiplier multiplier effect and the pledge that leaders take is, is women. Now, every workplace, you know, you will remember Chitra and I, I certainly have seen that and it's no longer, but you know, when we started this conversation about women, bringing women into the workforce in a more meaningful fashion, the biggest constituency of people we have to convince is the men, right? Because they are in the majority. And the That's majority right. is acceptance of, not acceptance, the majority is a role to play in making women who come into the workforce, whether it's sales or anywhere else, feel included in a part of the team. So we have a program at Cisco called Men for Inclusion, which is about the 50% of the population becoming an ally and a support system and a, uh, you know, to speak up for women in case they are not able to speak up for themselves. So that other women can speak up for them, but men in their team can also speak up for them. So we have Men for Inclusion, which is a very active. I'm happy to say that at Cisco, it's a very active moment. And again, that's a space where anybody can lead from the front, right? You don't have to be a leader to be a part of MFI. So that's another one we do. And then we do a number of outreach programs in, in the, uh, you know, more broadly outside Cisco also, Chitra, because we hope that in our endeavors outside, to, outside Cisco, then that attracts people to Cisco as well. So in our NetEcad program, which is our training skilling program in the country, we have to date done about 9 lakh people, and 30% of that is women. The instructor pool is increasingly getting diverse. So about, again, almost one third of the instructors, a little over 30 are women instructors. We recently uh, launched a program focusing on cybersecurity, women in cybersecurity. So, you know, we are doing our part to make sure that on the external to Cisco skilling side as well, People get um, people get attracted to the Cisco brand as a place to as a place to come to. We have tech focused on uh, you know children, high school students. We try to bring them into our campus every year. We pick a different school or a set of schools and bring women in high school, girls in high school, into Cisco, so they know that a STEM education is very much uh, in their hands, right? To make yeah. Them. Yeah. yeah, we have uh, we run this seminar called Women Rock IT, which is again, an outreach program focused on anybody so that they come to it, they get attracted to the idea of STEM in general. I wouldn't say just Cisco, but STEM in general, and therefore make a decision that science and technology and engineering and math is equally good for women as for other other people. So, you know, a few things, but I think they all play together quite nicely uh, to, uh, to make sure that we make women feel that they are an equal and they have a role to play in uh, being STEM professionals and Cisco would welcome them to come to Cisco as well. Right. Again, very uh, relevant point you brought up here about increasing the talent pool, right? By educating young girls and encouraging them to choose science and technology and also by bringing back women who've taken a break, bringing them back uh, to the workforce. Very interesting points. Uh, because a lot of women drop out and then they don't have the support to come back. Yeah. But why do you think so few women uh, join sales at all? Why is it not uh, uh, chosen as a preferred career by women especially? So I think it's uh, there's, there's a lot of things about when people are making that choice, not often, you know, like I decided to, I didn't even look at engineering. So a lot of people don't look at sales because there are some uh, myths. myths about sales that proceed <laughs> that right. precede. Precede you know, stories about sales which precede the the job right so the first one you will hear is it's a high pressure job right now what is not said equally is that most jobs most ah, jobs pressure. today are high pressure if, you know if it's a good company if it's a go getter place most jobs have their degrees of pressure that comes with it the second thing you will hear is that there is a lot of travel you know, this this is one that you get, it is a qualifying statement. I have to talk about my own career. A lot of my, yes, 
you know, you have to travel for sales work. But again, it depends on your assignment. You know, a lot of women do travel, but only in the city where they are based for large parts of their sales careers. And right. it's not that everybody is packing a bag and leaving their house and going off to a different city. South every, America, yeah. Yeah, you know, every. And nowadays, connectivity is so good. Most trips within your region for the very, very large part of your career, you can you can do day trips. So the, this myth, which was a problem, yes, I mean, I'm not saying it's completely uh, erased, but there are many ways to manage this quotient if you if that's really what you want to do. And the third phase is, and I touched on it, Chitra, the ethics conversation, right? India is a market, is a emerging country. You know, the market has an underbelly and you will have to be, you will have to be, face the underbelly of the market and that, that's not I, something I want to do. Yeah, so these right. are three things you typically hear for women who are just coming out of the education system not to want to go into sales, right? It's high pressure. Maybe there's an easier job out there. I'm not sure. Right. So travel, travel is, you know, mostly, yes, there is travel, but it's not unmanageable with all of the connectivity today. The third is the ethical portion of selling in India, which again, you have to make a decision about how you want to sell. India is a booming market. It has been a booming market for the last 25 years. In my 26 plus years now, I've yet to see a customer who doesn't listen to you if you have a point of view, if you have a value that you bring to them and who will not do business with you despite. Yes, I mean, I'm also pragmatic. There will be some close-minded people who don't want to talk to you because you're a woman, but then you're, you know, there's so much opportunity in the market. You're better off moving on from them and doing stuff where you will be valued and people want to buy from you because they see value in associating with you. That's right. So, you know, it's, uh, I would encourage women not to make this decision from the outside. Uh, you know, forget about sales or anything else, right? And I say this now in, there's a perception you have about something from the outside. If it's something you really want to do or you're excited about and, um, it's a place where you 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 have no barriers in terms of how much you can learn, who you can meet. If that is what excites you about the job, then come try it and figure out for yourself whether it is really all those myths that you've heard are true or not. I think, Chitra, you've been in sales and in the banking industry. I've right. been in tech. We had long careers in both. And, uh, you know, we have the power of experience to tell all young women, come try it out for yourself. Don't believe all these bogey stories that you hear bogey is a good word yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. bogey stories that you hear come try it out for yourself it's right. getting better and it's gotten a lot better and it's uh, getting better every day and acceptance for sales the women in sales is, a, is, a, is actually much higher than it was when both of us perhaps started out and even then uh, after yes. the initial hiccup and the strangeness of it not on our side but on the people sitting across the table from us the minute we had delivered our first project, they were quite happy to call us up again and talk to us all over again, right? So uh, it's about building credibility. And once you have then it, it gets, it does become an, then you treat it as an equal, you don't treat it any different. That's right. So uh, uh, did you ever face the glass ceiling or did you ever face biases at work or did you ever feel that you were at a disadvantage uh, because you're a woman in tech sales? No, so not within, you know, like I said, there is, I am quite pragmatic about this, Chitra, and that's why I said a degree, you, uh, India is not a country where we can claim we have, we have equality under the law, but equality in the way, mindset is still not equal, right? I think we must accept and acknowledge, I do actually, I yeah. don't mind, I don't mind accepting and acknowledging that because then it helps us, it helps me to be very practical about situations. So in, in a situation if I believe someone is just behaving a certain way because they've not been exposed to a smart and capable woman, then you show up as a smart and capable woman and a salesperson and as a leader. Nine times out of 10, people will change their opinion. And I remember this exec in a very large uh, Indian company who after almost a year after I had walked in as the sales leader for that territory. So I had account managers and people reporting into me. One day called me in, after the meeting, he said, can I talk to you, Daisy, for five minutes? And I was wondering, one-on-one. -on -one. I was wondering, what is this about? Because it's very unusual for him. And we, I said, sure, sure, why don't we do that? And I sat down with him and he said, can you tell me, Daisy, how do we keep women? You know, I have a lot of women we're recruiting. We can't see, keep, seem to keep them, right? And can you give me, tell me what we can do to make this better? 
And I had a good chat with him and I said, why are you asking me this question? And he said, you were the first salesperson I met who was a woman. And you know, initially it was odd for me, but later I figured out that you were smarter than many of the other men I had met. It was a huge compliment, I agree, Chitra, but it was wonderful to have changed his experience, right? He had a certain way of thinking and to have changed his experience. So nine out of 10 times that happens, not everybody may admit it to us, but nine out of 10 times that happens. The one time out of 10, it doesn't happen. Like I said, I'm very happy to move on. I've also had a situation where I had a client exit on a large account. I had a very important stakeholder who would behave very nicely with the men, but scream at her. And she didn't know how to, how to handle this problem. She brought it to me and I said, okay, this is the level of expertise. So I called somebody else in the company who was a man and said, managing this person is up to you, right? And manage this conversation. So we don't have, you know, we'll still get our work done. So sometimes you have to maneuver around it also, Chitra, yes. and be pragmatic about it. Right. But the good news in India is you, have, you do have a very wide open market, right. lots of customers to sell to, uh, and no dearth of demand. <laughs> so That's right. you, you don't have to keep knocking your head against people who exhibit bias. Just, just move on if that happens. And the good news is your team will come around. You know, if you explain the situation to your team, they will come around and find a way to support you and jointly maneuver. You, you know, you don't have to figure out how to manage the situation all on, a, all on your own as a salesperson who's a woman. You can always enlist other people and more, they will show up to help you with that situation as well. So in the odd situation where bias does exhibit itself, just be pragmatic and practical about how to deal with it and move on. Don't get, you know, don't make that the reason for not having a career and a very fulfilling career 90 plus percent of the time just because of the 10% obstacle course that we have to run. So your advice to the young women who, who are even considering a career in sales is to be pragmatic, move on, accept that certain people will not change and just work around it and go forward Absolutely. and chase your goals. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I think more women in leadership roles in sales is definitely going to influence women positively to join sales roles. And the idea of elevating the sales profession as such uh, and also encouraging women to join will come, come in with more women leaders and role models because they can look up to them and learn from them. And once they see that they have dealt with all the three issues you were talking about, marriage, mobility, motherhood, when mm -hmm. they see that there are women who have faced these challenges, if you could call them that, basically they're just life stages, right? Yeah. I wouldn't call them challenges. They're yeah. life stages and everyone goes through them. Most people do marriage, motherhood, and I think it is just up to us how best we can manage both. On certain days, I think we have to prioritize if you have small kids and if they are sick, especially those days, it doesn't matter if you take a day off. You, know, you don't need to feel guilty and say, oh, I'm neglecting my job. And similarly, at the other end, you may have to take uh, time off from work to attend a parent teacher's meeting on one day. And I've never had, like you said, I've never had a single instance where any of my reporting managers has had a problem with this because I've always been on, on spot as far as my targets were concerned. So there was in sales if you're on your target you're king or queen so there are no questions asked yeah so yeah. great and uh one more question is uh out of the few women who join sales only about 35 percent at entry levels right there are many who drop out like you mentioned so what can we do in order to create and nurture uh more women sales leaders because there are so few yeah so I think the, the, like you said, the proximity initiative at Cisco is one such, you know, so the, the expectation of the leader who is getting proximate to someone who's different from them is that they are also a sponsor of that individual, right? right. So, and one of the, uh, you know, so they'll speak for them and they will open opportunities for them. Of course, you know, the individual has to be, has to have the skills and capabilities for the opportunities the leader presents. But often what happens to women is they're just getting into consideration. Uh, Chitra is not happening, right? Because it's usually a group of men talking about a group of roles that are open and usually they will think about their network. And this is this is nothing, no fault of theirs, but it's just a, the human way of doing things, right? You know five people and you know them intimately well. That's the thing. Women have always been bad at putting forward what their capabilities and skills are and putting forward what their ambitions are, right? Saying that, okay, if this role opens up, I might want to, I mean, I would like to raise my hands for it. So 
traditionally women do this quite poorly even if they are in the workforce you have to sort of i mean it's my experience that you have to sort of ask them is this something you'd be interested in so they don't do themselves any good service either so the role of a mentor or a sponsor is i think for women continues to be material and it's you know it's it's important to go that for anybody is material but i think for a woman it is even more because there are so few to your point there when entry level they are anywhere in that 35 to 50 and then the drop off happens often they will then be in like you know sub 20s as they go into middle management and even more even lesser as you go up so there is this necessity to take special interest right in order to make sure that they are making all the right moves and you know they are skilling themselves appropriately they are visible Uh, we have a program called dare in san francisco which is about because women shy away from being visible also right, right. so there's a program called dare which is about making very capable women visible to a broader ecosystem of people outside of their teams and you know getting people to participate in dare is the first step because uh, you know we acknowledge that there is a problem in visibility for women so leaders who get proximate who become mentors and sponsors programs that make women more visible to people and teams outside of their teams uh, and then putting them into and then just leaning in and you know leaning in and giving them opportunities which may not be cookie cutter perfect but with the expectation that and with all of the support system that they will grow into it as also right because if you try we've always this in sales always to grow the conversation is about supply and demand yes we have a job but the pipeline is not there right, right? this is this is a constant problem even if you talk to the best talent acquisition teams as regards women's participation in workforce they will say there are not that enough women to go out and hire and that expectation and that problem happens because we are looking for a certain very set set of skills so a little bit of leaning in will also be required i believe in addition to everything else that is already going on uh to set up uh, to make sure and then yes you're right this is already proven that if there are women in leadership the chances of more women getting hired in that team or in that company are higher as well i mean this is statistically proven so right it's one day at a time and it's not an easy easy problem to solve for but we believe these combination of things will will keep making a dent right that that's the expectation and then blind hiring right that's the other thing that companies are following i think it's as cool so we we have uh, we have embraced it which is essentially looking at a resume of skills not the, right right i read that the gender yeah, yeah not yeah. the you know so the you because often again here statistically uh, if you look at it women are being screened out at the at the resume review stage they are not right, being right. brought into the interview there's nobody on the interview panel who is a woman so you know who looks and feels and understands what this because it, the way in which people express themselves may be different so you know right. a very a very particular way of expressing your ambition versus another way of a softer way of expressing your ambition can be misconstrued as lack of ambition as an right. example so having having women participate in the interviews having women on the panel who are all, having women also in the panel to interview women who are women and men who are sitting across the table as candidates but to make sure this process is happening in a in a situation where unconscious bias is not creeping in right because right. it is unconscious conscious bias is easy to deal with unconscious bias is obviously the one you can't It's see can't. and the people don't think they have right and it, when we do awareness exercises in cisco also sometimes people say oh my goodness i didn't re- i didn't even realize that and these are people who are very emancipated uh, individuals who who don't realize that they also carry unconscious bias within themselves so it's a number of things to throw but i think yes pipeline making sure there's representation when you we are hiring for roles representation on the panel that's interviewing proximity which is mentorship and sponsorship making women more visible for roles both in within their teams and external to their teams all of these will have to be the companies have a role to play you know companies cannot say that we do not have a role to play because if comp- nobody had a role to play we would not be talking about the 100 plus year gap to equity that or equality that we are talking about at this point in time absolute yeah it will take us 100 years 100 for a more gender yeah. gender equal world yes yeah, absolutely equal. 
So, but I think we're going towards it because it, at least now it's not all talk. There is still action and there are a lot of companies working in this space. And as you rightly summarized, having sponsors, having mentoring, increasing the visibility and making sure that uh, women have the confidence to speak and to negotiate will certainly go a long way in uh, creating and nurturing more uh, women sales leaders. Uh, finally, I wanted to ask you that if there were, uh, uh, there were uh, three things you could leave with the members of this community, what is the advice you will give the young women? So I'll say three things. The first is, you know, be the best. There is no excuse to not be the best at what you do. So always be well informed. There's always be whatever are the skill sets of the job that you have to do. So if it's in technology, you better know the technology you're selling. How does that, what is the value that technology creates or has for the customer that you're selling to? So, you know, always being up to speed on all of the products you're selling, also being up to speed on the markets and the customers you're selling to and making this match between the two is uh, the value match between the two is the best skill that a salesperson has to create need in that market. And you better be very good at doing it, right? So skills and not just for salespeople, but I think skills is, is absolutely necessary and you cannot, and that skill includes the skill to maintain networks through the years. You know, once you uh, you have a relationship with a customer, follow that customer wherever they go. You know, all of the skills portfolio of selling is something that and communication, executive presence. You know, all of those bouquet of skills that you need to make a really great salesperson that you need to have. Uh, the second conversation I would say is about um, yeah. So the the staying updated on the skills portion is one. Two. Never be afraid to be yourself and also to speak up for yourself because nobody else will live up to your potential other than you. Nobody else has the ability to live, live up to your potential other than you. And that's, that starts with, that starts and has to do a lot with how you represent yourself, how you come to the party in terms of what you can offer to a role or a company or a customer and uh, representing your case always, right? Other people can help you and support you, but you are always in charge of representing your case and always in charge of your career destiny right? and your path and your career path. And the third is, because we do live in the world we live in, which is unequal, have the grit and resilience. You'll get knocked down a few times. Have the grit and resilience to just get up and move on. You know, just, right. you know those, those are three things. I think, I don't think even today, uh, Chitra, that these are not three rules that I follow for myself. Because you need this, right? Especially the last one has got nothing to do with being a woman. We live in such a VUCA world. Like you look at the last 18 months and what it has done to the trajectory of sales in the country. And now we have fingers crossed, touch world, whatever is your superstition. We've come out of it with strong demand. But the last 18 months happened, hasn't been easy for tech uh, salespeople in any industry, right? Because of the economic downturn that COVID has forced. So we do live in a VUCA world, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous right. world. So we must have that ability to bounce back, if I can call it that, from the natural obstacles that may happen to come in our way, not just because we are women, but just because the world is such a VUCA place. Right. And COVID will not be the last thing that comes along. So grit and resilience is as a very practical and pragmatic way of living life on a daily basis is important as well. Those right. are the way I would put top of the list, uh, Chitra. Right. So upsp uh, upskill, speak up and bounce back. Absolutely. Right. If I were to put it upskill, in very speak short. Speak up and bounce back. Absolutely. Bounce back. And the last one, I think, I think it applies to everybody, men in sales, men across, as well as uh, women across. Yeah. And uh, do you think that uh, uh, having diversity goals or having uh, diversity uh, KPIs included in leaders' um, goal sheets would make a difference to the kind of uh, priority senior leaders give to inclusion and diversity? I think I have shied away from it maybe because, I, I mean, personally, I shied away from that culture because at Vipro and in Cisco, that's not the way we like to do things, Chitra, because mm. this change is, has to come from inside, right? Mm. Mm. My worry always is when you put KPIs into yeah. a person, people will find out a way to ace their KPIs, right? right? But the change inside you can you can still remain where you are. So it is it's good to build a conscious culture, I think, where diversity and inclusion is one of your core values as a company. 
And anybody who doesn't ascribe to that core value doesn't have a place in the company, right? That should be the, that, that's the normal way of working rather than putting it into a goal sheet metric and, you know, everybody is acing it, but nothing changes in terms of the environment for women inside. It's better to have a set of leaders who genuinely feel from the inside that this is the only way to do things. And this is the right way to do things. And this right way of doing things is good for business. And we are all stronger to survive and do business and differentiate this business in a VUCA world when we have diversity, gender being the largest manifestation of that diversity. That culture and that consciousness in that culture is far better, I think, than a KPI-led uh, KPI -led structure. I mean, I, I don't know. So you feel, I, yeah, go on. No, I, I, I'm saying the goal sheet, you know, a metric driven, it's great to look at the numbers in an abstract, you know, right. just to see whether all of our efforts are paying off. But I would have, be very, very hesitant as a leader to, you know, put it down as a goal, goal for individual leaders and then drive down them to put that goal further down, etc. You know, it, I, personally, I'm not a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of the culture piece. I'm not a big fan of, of the, the forced, of the, of the forced, the forced change. Yeah, of the forced goal sheet change, which is no change at all, actually, right? It's, right. Just, it's, it's no, a compulsion. It's a compulsion. And, and another it's a thing. Reason, it's a reason why you, we have had fines in our country for many years for traffic uh, light violations. Right. But if you right. look at it, look at the way we follow, I mean, as a country, we follow the rules, right? If a cop is standing on the junction and he's more likely to catch us, he or she's likely to catch us, then we'll stop for a red light. If there's no cop, it's early morning and there's no camera, most people will break the right in India, right? So that, that kind of changes that. That is hardly any, I mean, the all of these rules and laws are only to ultimately to provide sustainable change. And what we want is sustainable change. I right. think we can, all of these KPIs can create change overnight. I don't think it'll be sustainable. I mean, it's a, it's a personal view of mine, but I don't think it'll be sustainable change. And what we yeah, I agree, I agree. A forced change is never sustainable. It is short term. It's short term. And it's a myopic approach. Whereas if, if it's a change which is embraced and accepted yeah. and wholly worked towards, I think that uh, there can be success here in this. Yeah. So with this, I will end the interview. It's really been a real pleasure to talk to you. And you've told us about your journey. You've shared your time with us. And I'm really very uh, grateful to you for sharing your time and your learnings with us. I'm sure this will benefit women who want to join sales, students of sales, as well as women who are already in sales careers. And having more inspirational women like you in leadership roles will certainly inspire more of us to join sales, remain in sales, and achieve leadership roles. So thank you very much for your time. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Shudra. Thank you again for having me. Bye-bye.